Federal Vision had this tendency to so emphasize the reality and the assurance of the divine promise given in the covenant of grace, such that it bore the character of I'm baptized, therefore I'm saved, and how do I stay that way? It it became a version of grace on the front end and now do what's in you on the back end. Welcome to Mid-America Reform Seminary's Roundtable Podcast, a broadcast where the faculty of Mid-America discuss everything from Reformed theology, cultural issues, and all things seminary. This is episode 91, and I'm your host, Jared Luchibor. Thank you for tuning in. Well, today marks the first of a couple of episodes where our professors deliberate on a rather interesting topic uh, that you'll find contained in some pockets of the Reformed world, that of Federal Vision Theology. What is Federal Vision? Well, here to help us out are Dr. Alan Strange, Dr. J. Mark Beach, and Dr. Cornelis Venema. Well, it's good to be uh, with my colleagues here today, and you as well, Jared, and all of our listeners. We're happy to come into your homes and cars and greet you. We're so thankful for those that Support Mid-America with your prayers and with your pocketbook, as the old preacher used to say, and all the ways that you are a part of the work that we do here. We're talking today about a movement that came to be known as Federal Vision, and um, that comes from a conference, a pastor's conference that was held at the Auburn Avenue Presbyterian Church, which was then a PCA church in Monroe, Louisiana, in January 2002. They held this conference, and their concern, uh, the concerns that they raised, um, had some legitimacy. They were, they were concerned that as we're in this land afflicted, you might say, with a low view of the church, these federal vision proponents uh, wanted to revitalize, you might say, and develop the doctrines of the covenant in the church. Let me just note here that that federal is just from it's from the Latin form of what means covenantal. So when they speak about federal vision, they're thinking of covenant, covenant head, that sort of thing. And um, these federal vision proponents were very concerned about a low view of the means of grace, a low view of the visible church, and they particularly wanted a view of the church that would stress, or they they were concerned about a view of the church that would stress the invisible at the expense of the visible, that would exalt the individual and the subjective above the corporate and the objective. And they thought that the remedy for this was to, um, to revitalize these doctrines and to teach the obligation of all members to live holy lives, uh, to teach what they were concerned about with respect to justification and sanctification, that these things were being separated. And uh, so there were a number of concerns that they had, some of which were legitimate, we might say. But I would say this, and I think uh, the colleagues here, we've all taken this view that while Reformed and Presbyterian churches may suffer from some of the things we've just talked about, um, what ails the broader body of evangelical churches uh, is not necessarily what ails our churches precisely in the same way. Uh, and we have within our theology what we need to deal with these things. And I think that's something that the Federal Vision proponents tended to miss, uh, that, that our theological, uh, ref- our theological formulations as found in our confessions weren't something that so much needed reworking, but living out. Uh, and so that's a little bit of a little bit of an introduction, and we could get into the the particular kinds of things that they tended to do. For example, the OPC, uh, along with the URC and others, had a committees to investigate, to study, to address these doctrines of new perspective, but also particularly a federal vision. And we listed what we thought in the OPC were twenty errors uh, that some one or more of the advocates of the federal vision held to. Um, And I'm not going to just read all these 20 errors uh, that we think that 
Federal Vision tended to, uh, but basically it was a kind of over-objectification of the Christian faith. If, If there's a concern, as the Federal Vision expressed, that too many people have too subjective a view of the faith, too low a view of things like baptism, they tended to go to the other extreme. They tended to see, for example, baptism as something that brought you into the covenant and you're good (laughs) as long as you obey. Um, Because one of their, that's a little catch there, one of their their great concerns, uh, one of the concerns of those that promote the federal vision was the question of assurance. A lot of the Federal Vision writers would say that many Reformed and Presbyterian church members suffer from a lack of assurance because people, you know, look inwardly and examine themselves a lot. And the Federal Vision men said that these, this unproductive self-examination is because the view of the faith that many hold is overly subjective. So the cure for such spiritual navel gazing, you might say, is a healthy dose of what they call covenantal objectivism in which baptism is said to regenerate. The Lord's Supper is given to all the baptized apart from a profession of faith and election is to be read through the covenant so as to avoid pesky dithering about whether you're elect or not. And if such covenantal objectivism could be properly understood, these Federal Vision partisans say, uh, if it could be properly understood and embraced, one would be pointed away from oneself to all the glorious objective truths, and one would be encouraged and assured. But federal vision, we could say objectivism, notwithstanding, unless one believes that the sacraments are saving apart from faith, and none of the federal vision people said that, assurance will always be a problem when faith is redefined as faithfulness or obedience. Because if we talk about justification, for example, being by faith alone, but then you redefine faith to be faithfulness or obedience, every honest, sensitive soul will have questions about whether they've been obedient enough. So you don't solve the problem of assurance, you create a new problem. I think when we consider the issue of federal vision, everyone who embraces a confessional Reformed historic understanding of the Reformed faith is sympathetic to concerns they had that the divine promise and the covenant of grace be so underestimated as to create really a a big question mark over every baptized person's head, as if the baptism itself is rather meaningless until the baptized person, an infant growing to tothood, to childhood, to teen age years and early adulthood, until they give uh, witness to the marks of faith in a Christian life. And up until that point, you should regard them as unregenerate. You should regard them as outside of Christ, even though they're members of the church. Outside of Christ though they have the sign of Christ and are marked with uh, the sign of the covenant that they're included and embraced and loved and, and the like. So FV, or Federal Vision, rightly wanted to oppose a certain underestimating of the sacrament and, the, and behind that the divine promise of God himself, right? Right. Uh, but as uh, Dr. little vipers in covenantal diapers, diapers. yes, <laughs> uh, and indeed we all are starting out such. But what is the nature of the promise and inclusion? And uh, so Federal Vision rightly wants to react against that. But as Doctor Strange has already pointed out, you don't solve the problem by making the the objective sign of baptism in this case, and being a recipient of such, as a kind of ex opera operato, that is, by the act perform, uh, a, a kind of abracadabra, wham, uh, you're regenerate head for head, uh, baby for baby, infant for infant, 
So the other side of it is Federal Vision had this tendency to so emphasize the reality and the assurance of the divine uh, promise given in the covenant of grace, such that it was it was it, it bore the character of I'm baptized, therefore I'm saved, and how do I stay that way? Well, in the way of faith, what does that mean? Well, what it came to mean when push came to shove is a, a version of faithfulness, a version of a faith acting by works of love and deeds of righteousness that revealed itself as authentic faith. And now we're cast back upon, and how authentic is that? And how righteous is your righteousness? So they actually, it, it became a version of uh, grace on the front end and now do what's in you on the back end. And uh, that created, as Dr. Strange already pointed out, a number of problems trying to solve an assurance question in one area, it came back, a lack of assurance comes back to us through the back door, so to speak. Well, one of the problems with the Federal Vision is you have a whole variety of writers. They're all associated and they're sharing some common themes, but some of them are a little more careful than others. And it, it's, it's difficult to sort it all out. Uh, to go back to Alan's early comment about the meaning of the term federal, one of their big claims is that the historic position of many Reformed theologians was really inconsistent on a number of points with a fully developed covenantal view. We haven't talked about this yet, but one of the elements of the federal vision position was the claim that because you're baptized, you've received sacramentally a confirmation of the promise that God makes to those with whom he covenants, you, you're in Christ and you have all of the benefit savingly of union with Christ. And you know yourself to be elect and participant in all of what becomes yours through union with Christ. Well, on that basis, they argued, for example, many of the advocates of Federal Vision for the admission of all children so soon as they are baptized by virtue of their baptism, by virtue of their being in Christ, by virtue of their participation in Christ, their being saved, it follows. So they, they felt that they were being more consequent, consistent in articulating what Reformed theology historically has affirmed regarding the status of children. Uh, the problem is, again, that um, their zeal to formulate the doctrine of the covenant in a more consistent fashion led them to make errors regarding the necessity of faith with respect to those who are admitted to the table, you come and are nourished at that table, uh, but you come actively and, and receive Christ sacramentally with the mouth of faith, to use the language of the Belgic Confession. And historically, Reformed churches have not been inconsequent about children and their reception at the table of the Lord. They just understood that the response required for those who are baptized to, is to embrace the promise by faith. And doing so, professing one's faith, you, you are received at the table. Uh, but it's an illustration of what has already been mentioned by Mark and Alan. Uh, by insisting and sort of collapsing everything, including election, and making bold claims about all persons baptized, objectively in Christ, participating in and receiving all the benefits of that, at the same time, then you, you begin on the back end, to use Mark's language, to accent the obligations of the covenant. And one of the presenting and perhaps most significant errors in Federal Vision teaching is with respect to the doctrine of justification. Justification is merely the forgiveness of your sins it reinstates you into a relationship with God, but now you're under the obligation of living accordingly. And so the instrument of justification became not faith as an act which receives, which is receptive, 
passive, recognizing and acknowledging that Christ alone is our righteousness, it very much emphasized the act of faith as an act of an obedient faith. Uh, an act, sometimes even the language was used of not faith as instrument, faith alone, but faithfulness or the obedience of faith or a penitent faith. Uh, and so, oddly enough, the irony is you try to solve a pastoral problem, give people assurance, go to your baptism. You know who you are by virtue of your having been baptized. Well, not so quickly, because what may once have been yours can be lost. And so you get all, a whole raft of errors tumble out. You end up with losable salvation, losable election, um, the instrument of justification whereby justification is maintained and ultimately confirmed at the final judgment are the works faith produces. And that's where I think in most Reformed churches that responded to the federal vision, <clears throat> that was the core issue. I mean, there are a lot of issues, including the one concerning the baptize, uh, the receiving of children at the Lord's table, the question of pedo uh, communion. But it was really justification that was the core uh, issue in conflict, and it was the corruption of that particular teaching that really produced a, a kind of formulation that, though robust in its affirmations about the confidence we may have that we're in Christ, uh, ended up with, well, is yours a true and living faith? Have you been obedient enough? Have you maintained your justification? Are you at risk of, through apostasy, losing what was once yours? And so all you know, the points even of the canons of Dort regarding the preservation of the, of the saints and the like begin to uh, be compromised. Yes. I mean, if everything's yours and you are actually, because you're baptized, because you're baptized— and a recipient of the divine promise. Therefore, you're saved. You're in union with Christ. You're reckoned righteous in him. You're regenerate, born again. You have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. You have all the full privileges of what it means to be united to Jesus Christ. Yet, which also means, I guess, you're elect, right? Because you belong to him. His blood was shed for you. You're atoned for by him. Yet, you can not persevere in that way of union with Christ. That Well, there goes perseverance of the saints. Yet, you can resist this saving grace of God such that you're no longer saved. There goes irresistible grace. Yet, uh, the atoning work of Christ for you on your behalf to reckon you righteous and your sins forgiven, oh, but that can be undone. There goes the effectual atonement of Christ. Uh, yet, I mean, all all the points of Dort tumble, and the supposed uh, and the supposed assurance that they're seeking to give people that clearly falls. That falls too. So, rightly wanting to oppose a kind of underestimation of the divine promise and the sacrament, the sacraments that go with it, to overinflate the sacraments to do something they can't do is an error as well and a serious one, and that's why it's been opposed by confessing Reformed churches. Well, in one of the uh, those 20 points, you men have just mentioned a lot of those 20 points almost as they're here, and point 20 sort of speaks in a broad way saying, ecclesiology that eclipses and swallows up soteriology, which of course is a is a problem with the Roman Catholic Church, and that there's that tendency in that direction. And let me just say, I, I think Dr. Beach is going to mention uh, some things we've written here, uh, but but what I'm quoting from is an article uh, that I wrote that's published uh, in the uh, in the OPC magazine, New Horizons, back in February 2007. It might be something handy. You can get it online. The issue is called Getting the Gospel Right, and Dr. Venema has the lead article by that title, and David Vendrunen has an article titled Justification, What the Debate is All About, and Richard Gaffin has an article, Justified Now and Forever, sort of to what Mark Beach was just talking about, and then I have this article, Understanding the Federal Vision, where we just try to lay it out in a basic, simple way, but the the whole project the federal vision project 
of let's revive the covenant and the church, one of the things we note in these 20 points is that their their version of reviving the covenant is a, mon- a mono-covenantalism that sees one covenant that originates in the inter-Trinitarian fellowship. There are problems right there. Uh, but man is invited into this, and they flatten the concept of the covenant, and they deny the distinction between the covenant of works and the covenant of grace. And there are a lot of things that go along with that. We've mentioned some of those. One of them we haven't distinctly mentioned, but certainly marks some of the some of the partisans, and one of the the leading uh, fellows in it uh, is a denial of the imputation of the active obedience of Christ in our justification, which is a rather serious matter, that Christ came and lived in our place. He not only died in our place, in our place condemned he stood, but he completely kept the whole law for us. And of course, part of the reason that that that's not there. If you look historically at someone like Piscator who denied the imputation of active obedience, he did it to make room for our obedience, our obedience to come into view, which of course in justification, in justification, notice what I'm saying, our obedience is not in view at all. Now that we know what federal vision is, what is the appropriate response to it? Dr. Beach opens next time by reviewing a booklet that the Faculty of Mid-America published in 2007 called The Doctrinal Testimony Regarding Recent Errors, where they identify carefully, explain clearly, and evaluate pastorally the errors of this teaching. For more episodes, you can find us on our website at midamerica.edu slash podcasts and wherever you listen to your favorite shows. Be sure to search for and subscribe to Mid-America Reform Seminary's Roundtable. I'm Jared Luchibor. Catch you next time.